Ah, uh, what's up, LJ Bros and Broettes? We're doing math on the internet, so don't adjust your TV sets. Let's get linear. Today we're going to be taking a look at dimension and rank. So a very, very important conversation for us. And let's go ahead and start talking about it. Dimension. The dimension of a non-zero subspace H, denoted dim H, is the number of vectors in any basis for H. The dimension of the zero subspace, which is the set containing the zero vector, so this is the zero vector in a set, is defined to be zero. So if I have a set, and in that set, the only vector I have in it is the zero vector, the trivial vector. The dimension we say is zero. Even though there's one vector in the set, namely the zero vector, we just sort of give it this special consideration. Otherwise, for dimension, it's just the number of vectors in a set. Unless it's the zero vector, then we define that dimension to be zero. And so it's really kind of just like a cardinality argument. Definition. The rank of matrix A, denoted by rank A, is the dimension of the column space of A. So if I find the column space, I build a basis for it, and I find how many vectors are in my basis for the column space, that is the dimension of the column space, which we can also refer to as the rank of the matrix. So rank and dimension of column space really refer to the same thing. And then we have the rank theorem, which is a very nice... Uh, arithmetic formula we have it says if matrix A has n columns so remember we're talking about an m by n matrix if matrix A has n columns then the rank of the matrix plus the dimension of the null space of that matrix is equal to n and this is a very important formula for us to be working with so I'm gonna box it n refers to the number of columns in the matrix A if I find the dimension of the column space of that matrix A, which we could call the rank, those two are, think of them sort of, they're, they're not quite synonyms. We're going to see later what the distinction is. But for now, think of this rank as the dimension of the column space. And then if I add it to the dimension of the null space, that should give me something that sums to the number of columns that I have. And there's some intuitive sense to that, which we can make later. We have a nice theorem, the basis theorem, says let H be a p-dimensional subspace of Rn, any linearly independent set of exactly p elements in H is automatically a basis for H. Also, any set of p elements of H that spans H is automatically a basis for H. And then we're back to our invertible matrix theorem. And if you remember, we talked about this earlier in the course. We're still saying all of the things that we said before, but now we're adding to the list. So we're continuing on that. We're saying let A be an n by n matrix, a square matrix. Then the following statements are each equivalent to the statement that A is an invertible matrix. And all of the old stuff on that list as well. So it's just not written down here, but it is all still on this list. We're adding to the list though. Okay, so adding to the list, we have the columns of A form a basis of R, and this should be Rn, so that is a typo. So I'll fix it there. The columns of matrix A form a basis of Rn. We continue on. We say the column space of A is equal to the vector space Rn. And then the dimension of the column space of A is the number n. Similarly, we say the rank of that matrix A is also the number n. Then we have the null space of that matrix A is the set containing the zero vector. And that's the zero vector. And then lastly, the dimension of the null space of A is equal to zero. Right? We say a set that just contains the zero vector in it, we assign to that a dimension of zero. And we're still not really done with the invertible matrix theorem. There's more to it, but for right now, we're going to pause and... We'll come back to the invertible matrix theorem. We'll add more to the list. Let's take a look at some familiar examples from last time, but there's going to be an added twist to it, though not too much extra work for us. The following exercise that we have here gives us a matrix A and also an echelon form of that matrix A, so partially reduced but not fully reduced. I would like to find bases 
for the column space of A and for the null space of A. And then from there, I want to state the dimensions of these subspaces. So remember what we said last time, if I'm trying to build a basis for the column space, it's my pivot columns that are going to, that are going to build that for me. So I'm looking here at the reduced version of the matrix. And I can see here, I have a, a leading entry, it's a leading one. So this is a pivot position. And that is in column one. So first row, I go in and bam, right away, I hit that, that pivot entry. Column one is a pivot column. So I'm going to make a note here. I'll underline that's a pivot column. I want to do this from the original matrix to build my basis for the column space. Let's go to row two. So I go in, I pass through any zeros, and then I hit this five. And it should be a leading one. I can deal with that later. But right now, this is my leading entry. And this is my pivot position, which means this column, column three, is a pivot column. So column three. And that's in the original matrix. I'm always going back to the original. And then if I go through rows three and four, those are rows, rows of all zeros. So there's no leading entry. There's no pivot position there. So I'm actually done at this point. So since I have a pivot column in column one and a pivot column in column three, it's those columns in my original matrix, the original one, go back to the original, that are going to build the basis for my column space. So I'll say, okay, basis for column space of A is going to be given by, I use the curly braces, and it's going to be those two vectors. I'll separate them with a comma, and that first column, take it from the original matrix, is 2, 3, 0, negative 3. And that third column taken from the original matrix is negative 5, negative 8, 9, negative 7. And now I want to mention the dimension of the subspace. Now the dimension, all the dimension is, is how many vectors are in the set. Remember, if it's just the zero vector in the set, then we define that to have dimension zero. But if I look at this, we'll say, okay, well, how many vectors are in the set? One, two. I have two vectors in my set, first vector, second vector. So we'd say then the dimension of the column space of A is two. I have two vectors in this set. If you want to get really fancy with what's going on here, you could actually describe this in a very nice way. We could think about where these vectors live. The vectors have one, two, three, four entries in them. So these vectors live in R4. Right? That's what their home is. Their home is in vector space R4, and there's two of them. So in this case, my column space of A, if I want to really be fully detailed in this, I could say that this is a two-dimensional subspace of R4. We said these vectors live in R4. I have two of them. So this is a two-dimensional subspace of R4 when we talk about our column space. Really interesting stuff. We'll see more examples of this too. Now I want to move on to talk about the null space. Now for the null space, I should be doing more row reductions. Let me rewrite this matrix. 1, 2, negative 5, 1, negative 4. And then that second row, I'm not going to scale it yet. We'll talk, we'll talk about it. So I'll rewrite it and then I have Got to scooch down here, but the rest of the rows were rows of all zeros. So I should be able to remember that. Remember though, so I actually didn't maybe want to close this off quite yet. Remember though, we want to augment this with the zero vector. Because now we're solving that homogeneous system. I'm trying to build a basis for the null space. So I'll make a little note here. Now we're doing work for the null space. Now, if you're going through and trying to do row reduction in a very algorithmic way, you would likely want to scale row two. Why not, right? But if you sort of don't ignore the human aspect of what's going on here, I have a very nice situation going on with the, the next row operation I want to do anyways. So it's maybe not too bad to just kind of roll with it. Because what I want to do, well, if I look at this pivot column in column one, it looks perfect. My pivot column in column three needs some work. I do have to scale 
but I also want to get rid of this negative 5 above the leading entry in row 2. And to do that right now is very, very nice. Very, very nice. I'm just going to replace row 1 with row 1 plus row 2. You can judge me if you want to. I don't feel like I'm above judgment, but honestly, I think it's fine to do this. We'll, we'll just do steps in a different order. So 1 plus 0 gives me 1. 2 plus 0 gives me 2. Negative 5 plus 5 gives me that 0 that I wanted. You know, haters are going to hate. A 1 plus 0 gives me 1. Negative 4 plus 5 gives me 1. And then this is augmented with 0 plus 0 gives me 0. And then I can rewrite row 2. Not so bad. And then, of course, rows 3 and 4 are rows of all zeros. So now all that I really have to do is scale row 2. Say, well, 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 we didn't intend to not scale it. We always were going to scale it. We're just going to scale it now. So I'm going to replace row 2 with 1 fifth row 2. You rewrite row 1. Get that out of the way. Of course. Row 2, if I divide everything by 5, is going to give me 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then augmented with 0. And then rewriting rows 3 and 4, those are row, rows of all zeros, all zero entries. Now we can check. So I have my pivot column in column 1 looks great. My pivot column in column 3 looks perfect. And then that's all that there is to it. Now I want to build a basis for the null space. And I do this just by building the parametric vector form of the solution that I'm building here. And if I remember, Columns 1 and 3 were the pivot columns, which means I have free variable in column 2. So x sub 2 is a free variable. And then columns 4 and 5 as well. So I have free variables x sub 2, x sub 4, and x sub 5. And we've seen, we have had lecture already on building this parametric vector form of our solution here. So I'm not going to go through all of the steps to decompose that, but we will go ahead and write out the results. If you have any questions on it, you know, just let me know. I'm happy to talk about it. I gotta kind of scooch here a bit. My little face is in the way, my little face box. So let's see how this is gonna look. So here, if I solve for basic variable x sub one, remember I have to subtract these terms over, I'm gonna have a negative two x sub two, a negative one x sub four, and then a negative one x sub five. But next would be the entry for x sub 2, right? It goes in order, x sub 1, and then that would be x sub 2, and x sub 2 is a free variable. So x sub 2 is 1 x sub 2, 0 x sub 4, 0 x sub 5. Next would be x sub 3, so we go back. So x sub 3, if I were to solve for it, it would be a negative 1 x sub 5, but then zeros for everything else. So that would be 0 x 2, 0 x 4, negative 1 x 5. And the next spot is for x sub 4, so that's my free variable. I just want to keep it alive. So 0x2, 1x4, 0x5. And the last entry is for free variable x sub 5. So 0x2, 0x4, and then 1x5. So there I have my parametric vector form describing my solution. But it's these numerical vectors that are going to build the basis for my null space. I think of this as the span of these three vectors, right? These are just scalar weights. I can pick them to be any real number I'd like. So my null shape really, sorry, my null space really gets its shape from these numerical vectors. So we'd say, okay, the basis for the null space is going to be the set containing these three vectors. I got three vectors. want to separate with commas. And the first vector is negative 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. Second vector is negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And the third vector is negative 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1. And this builds the basis for my null space. But now I want to know the dimension. Well, I just need to know how many vectors are in here. I have one, two, three vectors in the set. First vector, second vector, 
third vector. That's the dimension. So the dimension of the null space of this matrix is three. I have three vectors. Now, if I want to get real fancy and describe this in a very precise way, we can talk about where these vectors live. There's one, two, three, four, five entries in each vector. I got five entries, five entries, five entries. So these vectors live in vector space R5. But I have three of them. So this is a three dimensional subspace of R5. And remember, when we build a basis for the column space of A, that's a subspace of Rm, M, and a basis for the null space, that is a subspace of Rn. So important to keep that in mind for an M by N matrix. But here the dimension is what I was asked for, 3. And if I want to check that rank nullity theorem, if I add the dimensions together, so it was 3 for the dimension of the null space, and two for the dimension of the, I have it written here in, in English, but we could say dimension column space of A is two, or that's the same as saying the rank of the matrix is two. If I add those together, two and three give me five, which is the number of columns that I have, just as promised in this theorem up above here. If I add the dimension of the column space or the rank to the dimension of the null space, it should give me the number of columns. We had two plus three gave me five, just to see how that's working. Let's see another example. All right, more and more of the same stuff. Here, if I'm looking for those pivot columns, I move in, there's my leading entry, it's a leading one. Column one is a pivot column, but I wanna focus on the original matrix. Column one is a pivot column. Go to row two, pass through any zero, and I hit the first non-zero entry. It's this two here. It's a leading two, which we gotta deal with that eventually, but that is in column two, that's a pivot column. Column two is a pivot column. Row three, pass through any zeros until I hit that leading entry. It's a leading five, okay, but it's in column three. Column three is my pivot column. Only one more row to check, go through all zeros. I pass right through it, so that's it. So I have these three pivot columns. Columns one, two, and three are my pivot columns. I wanna think about them from the original matrix, not the partially reduced version, and I can build my basis for the column space. So basis for the column space of A, it's gonna be this set containing three vectors. separate with commas, and this first column is 1, 5, 4, 3. Second column is 2, 1, 6, 4. Third column is negative 4, negative 9, negative 9, negative 5. Now I want the dimension of the column space. I want to find the dimension for the subspace. How many vectors do I have in the set? 1, 2, 3 vectors. So we'd say the dimension of the column space of A is three. The dimension of the column space of A is three. Here's my basis. There's three things in it, so the dimension is three. And again, if I wanna get real fancy, look at these vectors, where do they live? There's four entries in each vector, four entries. So these vectors live in vector space R4. So my column space here is a three, dimensional subspace of R4. If I want to really talk about what this represents, well, that's what's happening. That's the situation. Let's go ahead and talk about the null space. So let me rewrite the original matrix and augment with the zero vector. The first row was 1, 2, 8, 4, negative 6, and we're going to augment with a 0. Second row was 0, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, augment with 0. Next row was 0, 0, 5, 0, negative 5. We're going to augment that with 0. And the last row was a row of all zeros. 
and we augment with the zero. Now again, I'm going to do my row reduction. My first column as a pivot column looks great. Second column, not only do I want it to be a leading one and not a leading two, but I got to get rid of that entry above it. And just focusing on that, I think it's perfectly set up to just do a row replacement. I'm not going to worry about scaling right away. I'm going to go to row one and replace row one with row one minus row two. And one minus zero gives me one. Two minus two gives me that zero that I wanted perfectly. Eight minus three gives me five. Four minus four gives me another zero. Careful with your minus signs. Negative six minus negative one is negative six plus one gives me negative five. And then augmented with zero minus zero gives me zero. And then I can rewrite row two. I can rewrite row three. And row four. looks really good so far. Now, I can't help, right? I'm, I'm a person. I'm not a computer algorithm. I'm not a robot. I can't help but notice with rows one and three, I have this very nice similarity. And in fact, if I'm looking at my pivot columns, column one looks perfect. Column two needs still to be scaled. Well, I, can, I don't scale columns, but I would scale the row to make that pivot column look great. And my pivot column in column three there's a few things I have to fix. First of all, I don't want the leading entry to be a, a leading five, but I need these zeros above it. And the way it stands right now, if I want to continue working in row one, it's almost too perfect. You know, if you, if you feel this way, you can let me know in the comment section below that I'm weak, just giving into the pressure here. But I want to do, I really want to do five minus five, and you can't tell me that you you think that that's a bad idea, right? I'm going to replace row one with row one minus row three. So one minus zero gives me one. Zero minus zero gives me zero. So satisfying. Five minus five gives me zero. Zero minus zero gives me zero. Negative five minus negative five gives me zero. A bonus zero. Gotta love it. Zero minus zero in the augmented entry gives me zero. Did it. I regret nothing. I'm rewriting the rest. And you're gonna say, all right, well, you know, quit. Quit doing this. I'll be on my best behavior now. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna scale row three. I'm gonna scale row three. I would scale row two, but I don't like fractions. I can maybe think about scaling it later on to see if that helps my migraine at all, right? <clears throat> Let's go to row three and scale it by a one-fifth. So I'm going to rewrite row one, which is one, zero, 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 augmented with zero. Row two, rewriting it, zero, two, three, four, negative one, augmented with zero. But scaling row three by one fifth, I get zero, zero, one, zero, negative one, augmented with zero. And row four is my row of all zeros. Now I still have to get rid of this three in column three, right above the, it's a leading one now. I gotta get rid of that three and I can do row reduction. So here I can replace row two with row two minus three times row three. And then that should work out great. So I'm gonna rewrite row one. In row two, I get zero minus three times zero gives me zero. Two minus three times zero gives me two. 3 minus 3 times 1 gives me 0. 4 minus 3 times 0 gives me 4. And careful with the minus signs. Negative 1 minus 3 times negative 1 is negative 1 plus 3 gives me 2. And then 0 minus 3 times 0 gives me 0. And I can rewrite row 3, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, augmented with 0, and then row 4. Now, I still have to scale row two, but it actually looks like I can scale it and feel pretty comfortable with it. So I'm going to do uh, one half row two. So row one, rewriting it. Row two, if I divide everything by two, I get zero, one, zero, two, one, augmented with zero. Row three, rewriting, and row four, rewriting. 
Now remember, I want to go ahead and build the parametric vector form of my solution. Columns one, two, and three were my pivot columns, which means those are my basic variables. My free variables are in columns four and five, right? So x sub four and x sub five are my free variables. And let me go ahead and write down what that parametric vector form is gonna look like. If you're still kind of struggling with the parametric vector form to describe solutions to the homogeneous, check back on the previous videos. Let me know what questions you have. I'm here to help. If I solve for basic variable x sub one, it's just gonna give me zero, right? This row is telling me x sub one is equal to zero, which means a zero x four or a zero x five. If I solve for basic variable x sub two in row two, remember I have to move these terms over, I have to solve for it. So equals zero, and then I swing these terms over, it's gonna be a negative two x sub four and a negative one x sub five. Solving for x sub three, right here, if I move this over, so it's a one, I have a stray mark that I introduced, it would be x sub three equals one x sub five, so that's zero x sub four and one x sub five. And the spots that I have left are just for my free variables. So x sub four is one x sub four, zero x sub five, x sub 5 is 0, x4, 1, x sub 5. And this is my parametric vector form describing the solution to ax equals 0. And this is going to tell me what the basis for my null space is. I just want these numerical vectors. So basis for the null space of A is going to be a set containing these vectors. vector that I have is 0, negative 2, 0, 1, 0, and this other vector 0, negative 1, 1, 0, 1. And I want the dimension of this. Well, how many vectors do I have? 1, 2. Two vectors in the set. Here's my set. I have 1, 2 vectors in it. So the dimension of the null space of A is 2. But if I want to talk more about this, there is more that I can say. Where do these vectors live? They live in vector space R5. I have one, two, three, four, five entries in each vectors. So we'd say this is a two-dimensional subspace of R5. Let's take a look at a sort of a bit of a thought-provoking question. Suppose a four by seven matrix A has three pivot columns. Is the column space of A equal to R3? And what is the dimension of the null space of A? We'll answer these questions one at a time. But you know, pause the video, think about it. Let me know in the comment section below. What do you think? Is the column space of A R3? Let me know. Hey, welcome back. If you paused that video, welcome back. Let's talk about this. Is the column space of A equal to R3? The answer is no, no it's not. And it's a bit misleading, but let's talk about why the answer is no. For an M by N matrix, the column space is a subspace of RM. And then while we're writing it, we'll say the null space is a subspace of Rn. Very important to notice the column space is a subspace of Rm. Now I'm told that I have three pivot columns. What does that actually mean? It's not useless information. The fact that I have three pivot columns is telling me that the dimension of the column space of A is three means I have three vectors that belong to that subspace column space. But if I want to talk about a vector space, R3 makes no sense. R3 is completely off topic here because the vectors don't live in R3. Right? This is a four by seven matrix, so my column space is a subspace of R4. These vectors live in R4, so although there's three of them, the column space can't be R3. That doesn't even make sense if you think about it, right? R3, where do they even come from? No, no, nothing here is living in R3. 
these vectors in the column space as a subspace live in vector space R4. So these vectors live in R4, and what does that mean? Well, if I wanna kind of fix this, if I'm trying to rewrite this statement and not just answer the question, the answer is no. Right? If you just want the answer, no. No. But if you wanna actually talk, if we're here to talk, you wanna to talk to me, then what you're gonna tell me is you're gonna say that the column space of A is a three-dimensional subspace of R4. That's what's going on here. The dimension is three. R3 doesn't even come into play. It's a three-dimensional subspace of R4. Let's switch colors. Because now we want to answer this next question. What is the dimension of the null space of A? Now this is where we want to use that rank nullity theorem. It says the rank of a matrix A plus the dimension of the null space of that matrix is equal to N, where N is the number of columns that we have. And I can actually fill in this information. Remember that the dimension of the column space of a matrix is the same as saying the rank of that matrix. So we could say that the rank of matrix A is three since we have three pivot columns. So I know this. I don't know what the dimension of the null space is because that's what I'm being asked to find. But I am told the size of the matrix. It is a four by seven matrix, which means seven is N. I have seven columns. And now it's just arithmetic. I just have to subtract, right? The dimension of the null space of A is seven minus three. Probably don't even have to write that step. It's four. The dimension of the null space of A is four. Remember, this is just talking about the dimension, how many vectors belong to the subspace. But where does the subspace live? Remember, we said null space is a subspace of Rn. So the vectors that are in the null space are relatively lengthy, right? These are vectors that live in R7. So if I wanna talk about null space, we could say the null space of A is a four dimensional subspace of R7. These vectors live in R7. Now, there's one sort of trick that I want to talk about before moving on to uh, the next, next question. If you're just not sure, if it's difficult to visualize, if it's difficult to think about, draw a picture. Draw a picture. Because I'm told the size of the matrix right away. It's a four by seven matrix. Four by seven means I have four rows and seven columns. So if I remember that, it can take some of the guesswork away. I have four rows and seven columns. So here I could, you know, just filling in for the, the first row, or the first column, I should say, I have four rows, seven columns, I'll use A. But I'm not gonna call all of these entries A because they could be different. So I could do A1, A2, A3, A4. And then I'm going to have seven columns. So we have what, A, B, C, D, E, F, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I gotta go to G. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then four rows, seven columns. I can fill this in. So B1, B2, B3, B4, C1, C2, C3, C4, D1, D2, D3, D4, E1, E2, E3, E4, F1, F2, F3, F4, G1, G2, G3, G4, just to help if you're a visual learner. And now we can really start to see the situation that we're talking about. We said that we have three pivot columns. And honestly, they, they don't have to be in any particular order. They could be spread out a bunch, but just for the sake of arguing without a loss of generality, let's say that the pivot columns are right at the start. They don't have to be, they can be spread out a bunch. You could have some zeros, you could have, you know, column one, and then the last two columns, for example, could be the pivot columns. But just for the sake of convenience, let's say, there's my pivot. 
there's my pivot, there's my pivot. Do they have to be here? No, they could be other spots, right? But let's say that these happen to be my pivots and it's a lot cleaner looking. Then we can see that it's these three vectors, or would be these three column vectors in my column space to build a basis. And these vectors don't live in R3 at all. They live in R4. There's four entries in these column vectors. But then from there, we can think about if we're solving, how many free variables do I have? I have one, two, three, four free variables left over, which means the dimension, how many items are in my null space. The dimension of my null space is gonna be four. There's gonna be four vectors in there. But if I think about how big those vectors are gonna be, well, each of these columns designates an unknown, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7. So I have to accommodate for each of those unknowns when I build a vector for something that's in the null space. So I'm gonna have four of those vectors. Well, those vectors are gonna live in R7. So maybe the picture can sort of help out a bit. Hey, let me know, right? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure you hit the like button, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and then make sure you write a comment below and let me know if you think that a picture like this could kind of help in a pinch. If it's if it's just too much to think about all in all in your mind, draw the picture, get the picture going. Hey, we're almost done. I want to talk about one last topic just to introduce it. We're not going to have a full-on discussion on beta coordinate vectors yet in the course, but we are going to have that discussion. But for right now, we're going to talk about it briefly and kind of colloquially, and then we're going to talk about it later on in Chapter 4. We're going to get some visualizations of it. We're going to get some nice pictures going. It's going to be good. But let's talk about it a bit now just to end the section. Suppose that the set beta with vectors b sub 1, b sub 2, so on and so forth to b sub p is a basis for a subspace of h. For each vector x in h, the coordinates of x relative to the basis beta are the weights c sub 1, c sub 2, so on and so forth to c sub p, such that x is equal to this linear combination c sub 1 times vector b sub 1 plus c sub 2 times vector b sub 2 plus so on and so forth plus c sub p times vector b sub p. And the vector in Rp, which we're calling our beta coordinate vector, here's how we don't, how, here's the notation, it's x sub beta, is the vector with those scalar weights. So those scalar weights, c sub 1 through c sub p, we build a vector, this is called the coordinate vector of x relative to basis beta, or simply referred to as the beta coordinate vector of x. A lot of different terminology here, uh, maybe scary to just hear me reading it or to read it on your own, but it's not too scary of an idea. The idea is that if I have a basis, I can travel that basis to reach some other vector. And if I want to know what the beta coordinate vector is, all that's saying is I want to know how I should be traveling along my basis vectors to end up at that destination. Sort of like if you were to, you know, want to get directions to go somewhere. You're already maybe familiar with the roads. You want to know how many blocks to travel. Okay, we'll go up two blocks, take a left for three blocks, up four more blocks, and then a right one block, and then that's where you want to be. Something like this is the idea. We're trying to get an idea as to how we can travel along our basis vectors to arrive at a specific location. Let's see an example of this. Here we have the vector x is in a subspace h with a basis beta with vectors b1 and b2, and here they're given. Find the beta coordinate vector of x. Now to do this, the idea is that I want to find values c sub 1 and c sub 2, where c sub 1 times this vector b sub 1 plus c sub 2 times this vector b sub 2 will bring me to this vector x. And what I can do is I can actually think of this just as an augmented matrix system, where here I want to take basis vectors b sub 1 and b sub 2, and then use it as a coefficient matrix and augment that with vector x. And then solving for it, we'll be solving for these scalar weights. So hey, it's just more of this row reduction, right? Let me know in the comment section below if you had a feeling we would do some row reduction today. We've already been doing it, but for this example. So here I'm going to use b1 and b2, my basis vectors, to build my coefficient matrix, these build the columns. 
And then I'm just going to augment this with vector x. And I want to row reduce. Well, OK, so here I'm going to go ahead and row reduce. Um, I like the idea of this 2 being up on top. Does it matter? No. Am I kind of crazy and, and very particular? Sure. So I'm going to swap rows 1 and 2. It looks good so far. And then I'm going to scale rows 2 and 3, just because I don't want the, the leading term to be negative. So I'm going to do a negative row 2 and then a negative row 3. So row 1 is this 2, negative 3, augmented with 0. Row 2, if I flip the sign, that's 3, negative 7, augmented with negative 5. Flip the sign on row 3, that's 4, negative 5, augmented with positive 2. And I'm going to start row reducing. Now, my 2 in the upper left corner is not a 1, and I could scale to get it to be a 1, but I can use it to get a 0, in particular where the 4 is. So I might start with that, replace row 3 with row 3 minus 2 row 1. So let me rewrite row 1. But in row 3's position, I get 4 minus 2 times 2 gives me that 0 that I wanted. Negative 5 minus 2 times negative 3, that's negative 5 plus 6, gives me positive 1. And 2 minus 2 times 0 gives me 2. So I actually already have part of my answer. And let me just rewrite row 2, since I didn't do that yet. Now, in a classic attempt to avoid fractions, I'm going to scale rows 1 and 2 up. So I'm going to do 3 times row 1 and 2 times row 2. So if I multiply everything in row 1 by 3, I'm going to get 6, negative 9, augmented with 0. If I multiply everything in row 2 by 2, I get 6, negative 14, augmented with negative 10, and I can rewrite row 3. And now I can do some row reduction in row 2. So here I can replace row 2 with row 2 minus row 1. So let me rewrite row 1. Then in row two's position, six minus six gives me zero. Negative 14 minus negative nine, that's negative 14 plus nine, is going to give me negative five. And then negative 10 minus zero gives me negative 10. And I can rewrite row three. But you'll notice now that if I scale row two and do a negative one fifth row two, so row, well, let me scale back row 1 as well while I'm at it. So row 1, I can now do 1 third row 1, bring it back to a familiar look. So dividing everything in row 1 by 3, I get 2, negative 3, augmented with 0. But scaling down row 2, dividing everything by a negative 5, I get 0, 1, augmented with 2. And row 3 is also 0, 1, augmented with 2. And I can actually eliminate row 3 entirely. Replacing row 3 with row 3 minus row 2. That's going to be 0 minus 0 gives me 0. 1 minus 1 gives me 0. 2 minus 2 gives me 0. Looks great. Now I just have a bit more row reduction to do. So I want to get rid of this negative 3, sort of cleaning up my second column. So I can work in row 1, replacing row 1 with row 1 plus 3 times row 2. So I get 2 plus 3 times 0 gives me 2. Negative 3 plus 3 times 1 gives me that 0 that I had wanted. And then 0 plus 3 times 2, 0 plus 6 gives me 6 in the augmented entry. And I can rewrite the rest. Now we can really see everything going on right now. I just want to scale row 1. We'll do a 1 half row 1. So we get 1, 0 augmented with 3. Row 2 is 0, 1 augmented with 2, and row 3 is my row of all zeros. Now this is telling me what those weights are. So right now I have the solution that c sub 1 is 3 and c sub 2 is 2. But if I want to write this as a beta coordinate vector, it should be expressed as a vector. So the beta coordinate vector for x, so that's x sub beta, 
is this vector with scalar weights in order, so c sub 1 is first, that's 3, c sub 2 is second, that's 2, and this is my beta coordinate vector. Now this is telling me how to travel along my basis vector. So let me get a different color, let me just show what this is really doing. It's saying, well here you should travel three times along vector b1, and then two times along vector b2, and that's going to bring you to vector x. We can use, so we're used to a standard basis in traveling. We're used to just working with standard basis vectors. I can work with a non-standard basis to achieve the same. And we're going to talk about this a lot more in a later section. So for now, we're just kind of building these ideas. But let's check it before we leave. So 3 times vector b1, vector b1 was negative 3, 2, negative 4. And then 2 times vector b2, b2 was 7, negative 3, 5. And then this should bring me to vector x, which was 5, 0, negative 2. But let's actually check it, make sure that's what happens. All right, so here we'd say, well, negative 9 plus 14 gives me 5. 6 plus negative 6 gives me 0. And negative 12 plus 10 gives me negative 2. So it does work. Right? This is telling me how to travel along these vectors to make it to my destination. Hey, we'll talk about these beta coordinate vectors a little bit more later on in the course. For now, though, I just wanted to introduce it here at the end with talking about dimension of our favorite subspaces, column space and null space. Thank you so much if you're still hanging out with me in the video. Let me know what you think about it. Uh, no matter where you are, make sure that you always keep learning, keep dreaming, follow your heart. I'm not really going anywhere. We'll be back at it with some more math soon. But until then, take care of yourself, and I will see you next time.